Second strategy to look at, planning your campaigns ahead. What do I mean by that? Well, here's one of my favorite charts that we've done so far this year, which shows in yellow in the background is the tweet volume on the hashtag World Cup. What does this tell us? Well, it gives us a kind of basic benchmark indicator of the level of hype and interest around the World Cup. It probably correlates pretty well with conversion rates, ROI during this period. You can see the group stages at the beginning, and you can see the two peaks at the end, which are the three are the quarters, the semi, and the final. It matches up very neatly, so we can use that as a kind of guide for what's going on. And if an advertiser can match that, they're probably doing a good job of planning how they're going to deliver their campaign during the World Cup. So, the blue line, the red line, William Hill, Lambrooks, what it shows is their World Cup ads, the traffic driven from them, when it is a specific World Cup ad. So it mentions the World Cup, or a country, or a player, for example. And we can see that before the tournament, they were there with pre-tournament offers. In the group stages, they were heavily invested. And then for the semi-final and the final, they came in at that point in a very pointed, direct manner. Compared to Labrooks, who did have a strategy of targeting certain rounds, but it wasn't as even-handed, it didn't show a completely natural plan throughout the whole tournament. Strategy number three, which is related but slightly different. You can plan around a tournament and know that the quarters and semis and the final are going to happen. You can say we need to distribute budget in this kind of way, but what you might not be able to do is understand which countries will progress or what events will go on. And what you can see is that in the case of William Hill, you can actually retell the events of the World Cup using their ad content, which is kind of cool. So in this case, we have the clicks driven by England events during the World Cup. If you don't believe me, this retells the story. Here is the traditional over-optimism at the start of the tournament. And then here is the inevitable and very sad exit. Then you have Spain. They had the shock defeat early on against the Netherlands, and all of a sudden, William Hill aren't that interested in the past that point. Or Germany, who in traditional manner, we're not that fussed about them until the semi-finals and something they take it very seriously. And William Hill made a very good job of really dominating on those terms at that time. We can also see across the market, uh, and this is particularly around sporting events, but it applies to most industries as well, is that the top traffic adverts tend to react to recent specific events. So here's a lab one. Betting on Brazil versus Germany, not just the match, but also that Neymar, uh, their star player, was injured, which you could not have predicted before the tournament. Or on the other hand, William Hill, an offer just for the final, 4-1 for Germany to lift the World Cup. They really targeted this final match, they made a big deal about it, and the users responded to their efforts. But, of course, to kind of come back to our theme of seeing the full picture, Rather than being a very isolated space, there is more to search and more to life than desktop people sit Here is a benchmark for the well, four of the key competitors in this industry, showing their mobile versus desktop impression share. So on the left is the mobile, on the right is the desktop. Gaming betting is quite an aggressive industry in terms of mobile compared to a lot. But what we can actually see here is whilst William Hill were very successful on desktop, Within mobile, they were a lot more conservative. Perhaps that's an area where they need to broaden their perspective, but if they can see from this that their competitors are being more aggressive, that's a piece of information they can take away and do something with, rather than this kind of mixed up, normal conversation that happens of, well, we don't know how much to invest in mobile, they can actually do something with this. And another area that we see a lot of interesting applications in, and it a huge variation that's done is PPC and SEO integration. I don't know whether you guys are more on the paid search side, the organic side, or maybe more on the rare breed, which is in both. But ultimately, the two sites often don't talk to each other. They may be in different offices, they may be in different countries, um, sometimes perhaps even in different planets. I'd like to talk about how we can better approach that. Things that we see companies doing with our kind of whole market view. I make a little reference to Sun Tzu's The Art of War, which is a kind of classic strategy book. It's so much commonplace in our culture and literature right now that most of the things in it, we just kind of take for granted. They seem like common sense, obvious statements. But if you look at search, in particular integration between pay and organic, what we tend to find is that these principles aren't really common. Start with a quote from the book, which is that if you know the enemy, and you know yourself, you need not, uh, need not fear the result of the other battles. Normally we focus on the knowing enemy part, but 
for this, this little chapter I'd like to speak about knowing yourself. What does that mean in terms of integration? Well, paid search and organic search are part of the same thing. They need to know each other, they need to be in conversation, and they need to share information about how their shared audience is reacting to what they're doing. We're not providing keywords. If you're on the organic side, you often be very frustrated with the lack of keyword text these days. The keywords being brought away and not really knowing much about what's going on. In paid search, they still have the equivalent data in terms of their paid results, search query results, and also, increasingly so, they have organic data as well, which is what I write, this is the way it goes. So this is the first obvious avenue for conversation to be opened up. Paid and organic should be speaking to each other about the paid data that they have, which could be used for organic in the form of what they do. It's not just about the data that already exists, though. It's also about the strategies that we use to gather data that might help the other side. If you're in paid, you usually think about tests for yourself, or in organic, you think about tests for yourself. You rarely think about the information you can gain which will help the other part of the team. But paid search is a much faster channel. You can put an advert or put two adverts up now on a keyword and know by tomorrow which has the best and whether that keyword is worth it. That's pretty crazy, that's an insane for, uh, fast testing speed. And SEO on the other hand is much slower to implement and it's much slower to point down the results. So what should we do? Well, the faster you can learn, the less expensive it is when you fail. You can adjust and make changes quicker. And as there's a shared audience, if SEO knows how the audience reacts to certain keywords or certain copy, they can avoid making the mistakes that they might have made if they go straight to it themselves. So you can see it's medium to test that. And finally, this piece of kind of knowing yourself, there's a real technology piece of it. If possible, the organic guys should be able to see within AdWords or whatever tracking software is used, and if possible, the paid guys should be able to see within analytics. But even more so, there is technology which really shares data across the two sides. It's something we're really proud and passionate about is that you can look at paid and organic data that's meaningful from both sides along each other. In this example for ASOS, New Look, and Next shows their search term coverage in each of the different channels. So what overlaps do they have with competitors? What search terms are they missing that they could gain? And what are the differences between the channels? And something pretty amazing happens when you take paid people and organic people and put these charts in front of them. They start scrambling over the details. They want to know why is it that they don't have this keyword gap that we have? What are they doing that we're not? Why are they taking this strategy when we're not? It's a shared language that the two sides can talk about, whether it's on desktop or whether it's on mobile. This is very, very valuable. Once we know ourselves, then there's a second lesson that we can tell, which is more about kind of picking your battles, I guess. With any search, so with any keyword, we have a variety of choices. Do we run a paid advert? Do we, run, uh, do we go for the organic listing? Do we avoid it altogether, or do we go for both? And something that we see consistently with our vantage vantage point over the whole competitive landscape is that the most successful advertisers understand they need to have a unified keyword strategy that works from one side through to the other. Here's fashion retail. On the x-axis, we have the organic share of voice and share of clicks in that market. And on the y-axis, we have the same but for paid search PPC. What do we see? Well, here, this big blue mark is ASOS. They are leading in terms of paid share of voice and organic share of voice in the UK. They are doing a fantastic job. And they're doing both at the same time, right? And what's particularly interesting is that when you dive into the details of the keywords, they have different strategies. They have a unified keyword strategy between the two sides. So starting at the bottom right of the chart, and this is the same thing but showing individual search terms rather than competitors as a whole. So this is all of ASOS's search terms within this sample. This one at the bottom right is shorts. So what do we know about shorts as a fashion term? Well, it's very high volume. It's very low intent, it doesn't specify a gender or a type of shorts, it could be pretty much anything. It's also a very high cost per click, and those two things combined means that it has very low profit margins. And if you look at this page, it is very organic dominated relative to most of the retail market. We have four organic listings and only one paid out at the top. PLAs are standard within retail, but generally it's an organic dominated page. And ASOS are here for organic, they haven't bothered about paid search. On the other end of the scale, we have Bando Tops as an example, that's the top left bubble. And what we see here is that there's a more specific, higher intent query. 
It's also a lower cost per click as well, and it's a paid dominant page. So before we had four organic listings above the fold, now we can only see one organic listing above the fold. And what ASOS have done is they've got double paid ads. They've got the PLA at the top, and they've got the first paid listing. They strategically chosen that one search term lends itself to paid investment, one lends itself to organic investment. And they've understood that the two can also cannibalize each other. You should choose the right time to fight with the right tool. Sometimes you might want to do both. And this is what ASOS have done on leather skirt, which is kind of an in-between term. It has perhaps not as much intent as Bando Tops, but certainly less, uh, certainly more than, than uh, shorts, for example. Um, and it's kind of in between in terms of cost and margins, all that kind of thing. But it has an interesting role to play within the fashion industry. It's a leading, it's a very new fashion trend that's emerging. And it's also highly seasonal. For those of you that don't wear leather skirts, if it's the summer, you probably don't want to. So what we see from the Google trend chart, another good Google trend chart, you can see it coming in the previous two years and having a very seasonal dip going around the summer each time. So why have ASOS chosen to double up with paid and organic search here? Well, we can look at a couple of key reasons. The first reason is that by having paid and organic, you raise your overall ceiling on traffic. You can have much more traffic than you can have with just one channel or the other. But secondly, PPC as a faster, more agile medium is something they can play or they can remove from play at any time. So if this is a term which during the summer is not very relevant, it's not really worth the ROI, then they can remove the paid search ads. That's a very simple thing they can do. And you can see from ASOS's keyword strategy, they understand the different kinds of keywords, how to use paid and organic in those circumstances. So, Laura kind of blasted through a lot there. I hope you found it interesting. This is a just kind of summary of the key message from our point of view, which is really only by observing your competitors can you properly judge your own performance. Can you properly see what's going on? Only then can you also understand the true reasons behind your performance. In the booth, for example, understanding that it isn't for internal initiatives, it's because of external things going on. And finally, the real key thing, being able to make the strategic decisions that make sense based on your experiences as well as those around you, whether they are positive or bad. Having this awareness makes a huge difference. So I, as I say, I hope you found this interesting. If you'd like to discover your own liberal world, then we'd love you to come and talk to us. We're at Athena, we are a trusted source for insights about your competitors. Um, you can visit us online at athena.com and the slides should be up very soon on at Athena. Uh, so go on, take a look, or talk to us. We're around in the blue and pink shirts. Should be our Thanks very much.